He recently joined fellow CEOs from Marriott and Hilton, who were selected as the top three hospitality executives of the year by Commercial Property Executive Magazine. A big warm welcome for Jay. So this is the, the second talk show we've done. Now I want to warn you, I love the microphone. When I'm not here and doing my professional job, I volunteer my time as a live auctioneer. So if I start to break out in fast speech, you know, forgive me. Um, I'll be able to follow. OK. That. So I want to give everybody a little insight into what Jay is like. I did some um, research. And here are a few of the wonderful words that describe him. And I think this might embarrass you. So uh, you already, you already have. OK, so, you know, so forgive me. As a leader, this is what uh, his employees say about him. Attentive, thoughtful, engaging and involved, approachable, roll up his sleeves kind of guy. Hmm. <laughs> He's a good teacher. He's extremely likable and super brilliant. Now, I'll tell you, your brother, on the other hand, described <laughs> you in a different way. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think before we dive into all things uh, Hersha Hospitality and all the great things you, you've done with the organization, can you give us a little bit of an insight into, you know, um, what you thought you wanted to be when you grew up as a kid? And did you ever sight, sit, have you set your sights on being a leader, a, 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 let alone being the CEO of an organization? You know, it's a good question. But, you know, before we get started, let me uh, thank all of you for coming today. Uh, Rabbi, thank you uh, for all the work you do for this organization. It's a terrific organization. It's great to see so many friends out here and meet, uh, meet, we meet some of the folks I haven't before. Uh, let me get back to your question. So what did I want to do when I grew up? Grow up? I, you know, b being the son of, uh, of Indian immigrants, you can probably guess what I thought I might do. I was going to be a doctor. And uh, when I was younger, I wanted to be actually a neurosurgeon until I spent some time in a hospital and I just couldn't stand the smell. And uh, so, so then I pivoted around and decided I wanted to get into business. But, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think sometimes, you know, Rabbi said earlier in his remarks, you know, it's, you don't find yourself in a situation, you make your situation. And that's true, but I think you've got to collect a lot of information, data, and experiences before you can do that. So did I set out to uh, do what I have with my brother at Hersha? I don't know. Directionally, maybe we did, but uh, as you were going through my resume, you can see I, you know, connecting the dots, it's a bit of a meandering line. Um, I tried a couple of different things, uh, enjoyed all of them. But over time, as I was doing each of those things, and particularly, uh, particularly practicing law, which is the last thing I did before I came into the hospitality business, uh, as much as I enjoyed it, I was always looking for ways to create the most value that I could. And I felt that uh, coming back into the family business at that time, which at the time was very small, we, we had six hotels in central Pennsylvania, and hotels is a bit of a you know, it's probably a bit of a uh, grandiose term for Best Westerns and Comfort Inns and Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, <coughs> Quality Inns. But, uh, but that's, what we, that's what we started with. But, you know, I, I felt uh, and my brother felt that the platform itself could really grow. And, and that's what kind of brought us in. So, you know, I, I would love to say that I had a clear intention and I executed on that, but I don't think that would be accurate. You know, what we do always talk about is really knowing who you are, right? So I think, you know, when, you know, when, we, when we think about what we're going to do next, we think about what's important to us. And I often talk about core values. We're very much a value-based organization. Uh, you know, our core values are honesty, communication, community, uh, achievement, and personal growth. And I think if you have have a real set of beliefs, then you can use that to determine what you're going to do and have a really distinct and differentiated point of view. And so when you know yourself, I think then you can also be honest with yourself about your strengths and your limitations and pick a tack or a track that's going to allow you to leverage your strengths. So you kind of take a look at the market and look at what you can do and see if you can find uh, uh, 
find a spot for yourself in what's going on. And then, you know, thirdly, it's really just all about, in our view, grit. Building a business is a pretty long slog, as most of you all know out here. You know, and we've been at this a while, so it's, uh, it's rewarding to see uh, what Neil and I and our organization have been able to accomplish. But, you know, certainly, um, you know, having that uh, get her done spirit mm -hmm. has a lot to do with it. Yeah, absolutely. So can you share with us a little bit about how you differ as an organization compared to other um, hospitality organizations? Because you take a much different approach, especially with um, changing of the economy back in 08, fast forward to 2016. Yeah, so, you know, going back to what I was talking about, when, when Neil and I uh, came to the business we felt that there were a couple of you know, there were a couple of big things going on underfoot, and it was hard to really put a finger on exactly what they were. I don't even know if they had names at that time, and it was really unclear how profound of an impact they were going to have. But today we call them the you know three major mega trends: urbanization, globalization, and digitization. So when when I came to the business about 20 years ago. You know, you were starting to see momentum building. There was, there was a reinvigorated interest in urban markets. Uh, you were starting to see a lot of density rebuild into the cities, which had kind of gone away for a while. Uh, the world was getting smaller, certainly. And so mm -hmm. globalization and digitization, I think the advent of media being so accessible kind of continued to bring, uh, bring those two mega trends into focus. And so. When, when Neil and I started and we set out in the business, you know, we obviously we didn't intend to continue to build out the portfolio. And maybe this is differentiated, right? I think a lot of people get into business and they think about cash flow. And you know, certainly you need cash flow. But we were thinking about cash flow as a way to invest capital in our growth. And so you know, from a, we thought of it as bootstrap equity. And we felt that it was a good idea to move to the cities because of these trends that we were feeling. And that, that was our strategy. You know, we'll move to the cities. Not really having better vernacular for it. And so uh, I think that's probably the greatest point of differentiation. So we own and operate hotels that range from three star to five star in six key gateway markets. And you mentioned them earlier, and they're somewhat intuitive. You know, when you consider on the West Coast, Los Angeles, the Bay Area, and then the major northeastern coastal cities in Miami. And over time, as we develop the strategy, you, you start to really study it uh, to make sure that you can affirm it year over year and that you don't need to make any major adjustments to it. And over time, what we have realized is that it was right on because about one third if not more, a third or more of the country's GDP is generated in the six markets that we operate in. Fifty percent of all unique international visitation comes through one of our six gateway markets. Uh, and these are also the markets that are continuing to see the greatest appreciation in real estate values. So when you put all three of those together, uh, it has really allowed us to build out a real differentiated portfolio. Mm -hmm. When you look back on all the things that you and your brother have accomplished, what would you say is your um, most successful failure, and, and what did you learn from that? You want the whole list or just the top <laughs> ten? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, you know, the road, uh, the road is uh, paved with potholes sometimes, but you, you, know, you, do, you do learn from them. You know, I often talk about the recession in 08. We had a great, you know, we generated a lot of value in the portfolio by developing hotels from the ground up. And you know, the development process can be very, very can be very lucrative and generate very strong return for shareholders, but it does carry a lot of risk. And um, in 2008, our exposure to development probably exceeded 10% of our balance sheet. And when, you know, when the recession came, not only were lenders threatening to pull loans, but the equity value in all of these development <laughs> projects that weren't generating any cash flow kind of disappeared in a wisp of smoke, you know, I mean, in, in, in a matter of overnight. You know, we think of the stock market as being volatile, right? There's always a spot price on your stock, and 
you know, that in itself is so labile and volatile. But development, you know, though, you know, though you've got something in place, an actual construction site, the equity in a development project is almost fictional until you have the hotel up operating and generating returns. And so uh, that was a very difficult time for us to work through. Uh, we have, you know, we have the distinction of not ever leaving a lender holding the bag. And I think that that has served us well because we've got very, very strong relationships with, uh, with a lot of the large uh, uh, lending institutions. And that allows us today at a more healthy time in the economy to really leverage what we can do. But uh, I think what we learned from that is, you know, as interesting as development is, you really have to be very thoughtful about how you allocate your capital and how much of your balance sheet you commit to it. So today we do do some development, but we probably, uh, you know, keep our allocation of development investment in the portfolio, you know, well below 5%, if not below 3%. Mm -hmm. um. So a lot of your portfolio, or I should say maybe the lion's share, New York, how do you um, view Philadelphia? What do you think we need to do a better job um, in doing to um, you know, bolster the city where you would say, hey, this is, you know, it's a, it's a key market for you now, but you know, it's rising up the ranks closer to New York as opposed to lower. What, what are we missing? Yeah, no, no, sure. The, I, you know, this question comes up a lot. You know, let me first mention a couple of things that are actually going very well in Philadelphia. I think Philadelphia has done a really great job at developing uh, the leisure business. You know, the, what Merrill Levitz has done, uh, what the city government has done, and the emphasis they've put behind uh, leisure draw has been terrific. Mm -hmm. I think we can do even a better job of it, but on the whole, I think we're very, very well positioned in that regard to you know, to take advantage of one third of the country's population that's within a six hour drive of here. Secondly, I think the changes at the convention center have been positive. I think the convention center can be a great asset to drive room night demand in the city. Uh, I think it took too long to get things, uh, you know, to, to right the ship, but uh, I think we hopefully we're past some of the avarice and greed and special interest and we can think collectively about what a, a positive convention center market can do for a city like ours. And you know, I feel good about that. I think what we can continue to work on in the city, what, what, we, what we lack very much here is a corporate demand base in the city. In every other market that we operate in, our room night mix is 80% corporate. So when we talk about New York versus Philadelphia, you know, Philadelphia is probably more 50-50. And at the end of the day, corporate travelers are price takers. Leisure travelers are price shoppers. And so in order to really drive uh, a healthy hospitality market, we need more corporate demand. When we talk about New York, so going back to New York, New York, even though there's been a lot of supply there, the city still runs about a 90% occupancy, just around 90%. And effectively what that means, I'm going to give you a little hotel lesson, I hope it's not boring, but when you run a 90% occupancy in a high corporate demand market, what that means is you're effectively sold out or running north of 95% Monday through Thursday. And uh, those are your peak nights. And you're probably generating close to 200 compression nights when you can really drive rate at the hotels. And then on the weekends, during leisure periods, your shoulder periods, you're running close to 70% at a lesser rate, but still pretty healthy. You know, in a market like Philadelphia, when you're under 70%, you know, you're not generating that many compression nights. So, you know, our peak nights in the city, strangely, are Tuesday and Saturday. And so, <laughs> Saturday being a peak night suggests it's a big leisure market, right? Uh, and those, you know, that doesn't really allow for uh, very strong rate growth uh, and rate traction. And add to that continued addition of new supply. Like every time you turn around, everyone's like, we need a hotel room. Just because it's hard to get a hotel room doesn't mean we need a new hotel. Because it's hard to get a hotel room on a Tuesday night, but on a Thursday night, there's all the rooms you could imagine that you need. And, uh, and so when then you have... So, so what are the two things we need? I think we need a far more business-friendly uh, environment in the city, whether it be by taxes or whether it be by special 
uh, incentives to bring businesses back into the city and headquarter here. We're starting to see a little bit of that in University City. I would like to see a lot more of that in Center City. And secondly, I think we, as a city, need to be careful about misaligning interests and inducements. And, uh, you know, instead of using taxpayer dollars to build more hotels, I think we should be using those dollars to attract businesses back into the city, large corporate tenants and things like that. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, recently read an article where you said it's a really exciting time, but to stay half a step ahead, you have to really invest time and resources to know where the puck is going to be so you can be, so you can skate to it, um, like Gretzky. Right. Right? Um, so where do you see the puck going? Stanley Cup finals were going on. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, what I was referring to in that, you know, we were having a conversation in this interview about, uh, you know, the future of hospitality. And what I was talking about in that interview was that, you know, today, as things, you know, as as the way we, as the way we shop for and consume hospitality today, things have changed a lot, right? And we talked about digitization earlier. And because of um, the transparency that the internet creates, having a clean hotel room uh, and having a certain level of service has now become table stakes. You don't necessarily need a big red M over your hotel uh, to be endorsing the fact that there's a certain quality standard you can expect, or there's certain uh, services you can expect, because today you can go to TripAdvisor, and the users of your business are publishing exactly what it is. And it's certainly far more credible uh, than advertisements and things like that. So because of that kind of transparency, and because the cost of acquiring a customer has come way down, you know, today uh, we can, with an independent hotel, with an optimized e-commerce uh, program at the hotel, you can attract customers without needing the brand. The brand used to be both quality assurance and an endorsement, and it was distribution. And today, you know, you can create distribution to the hotel in a, in a myriad of different ways. So, what do you do? So, tastes and preferences are changing. You know, everyone talks a lot about millennials, but I'd like to talk about more as sort of modern behavior, you know, modern consumer behavior. Uh, people travel and they want an experience, even corporate travelers, they want to be connected to psychologically. And so it's no longer just about e-commerce, it's about e-commerce 2.0, it's about service delivery 2.0, and really understanding the tastes and preferences of those that are staying with you, understanding the unique assets of the market that the hotel is in, and even more importantly, the sub-market the hotel is in, you know, where everybody is so much more interested in, uh, in pedestrian experiences, and when you're in urban markets, you can really help curate that for the guests that are coming, so that they go away with not only a comfortable bed, a good clean shower, but also a little something extra, you know, feeling like they were away, and uh, they were enriched by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but you got to really invest in that, you know, and uh, it, you need a certain level of scale or you need to be a real small operation where you can do it yourself. But if you're at scale, without feeling institutional, you have to create unique sort of curated experiences. Uh, and then secondly, what I was talking about as well is, you know, today it's interesting. I'm, you know, when you all make hotel reservations, I'm sure most of you make them on your desktop. and. You know, in the last 10 years, the 800 number uh, at Marriott or at uh, IHG or at Starwood has gone by the wayside. Today, close to 92% of all hotel transactions are made um, online. Interestingly, 72% of hotel shopping is done on mobile, but only 9% of the transactions happen on mobile. So the question is, why not? Like, why aren't we converting those shoppers into actual sales? I was at this. I'm at this, and I hope I'm not meandering. But I got I want to share this with you because it's so interesting. I was at this um, small meeting with the head of strategy for Google and Facebook, and they had this very creepy slide up, right? So the slide it showed the days of the year, 365 days of the year, and it showed uh, on the 
on the y-axis, it was showing how much time was spent on searches around Walt Disney World and Orlando. And obviously didn't use the woman's name, but there was a woman that had shopped for Disney 435 times on her mobile phone, on Google, in one year and never once made a transaction. <laughs> so, you know, the question is, do we need to figure out how to make the mobile experience more, better, both visually and from a number of touches and movements so that we can convert the sales? Well, you know, it, 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 these are the kind of things we need to think about. It's beyond just having a pretty website. It's about thinking about conversion through your websites and through your mobile websites. And, you know, how, you know what, are the, what are the different approaches to driving new demand that didn't mm -hmm. exist, incremental demand. What, what did they come up with in the meeting? Did they, did they have an answer? Did they have a, an idea of why that is? Well, yeah, I think the conclusion was is that the mobile experience is completely different from the desktop experience. That was the conclusion, and I think that's pretty obvious. You know, the stat is that, you know, most uh, professionals have 3.2 devices. And I've always wondered what that point two was. But like, but you know, you can imagine you have a laptop, you have a phone, and you've got your iPad, right? So everyone's got at least three devices. But each one of them renders very differently. Each one of them is a very different online experience. And so the question is, you know, how do you cater to each of those devices so that you're drawing through as many conversions as you are on desktops uh, that you can through mobile? And so it, a lot of it had to do with. Uh, the ease of navigating through the website because a lot of mobile websites are they're adaptations of an online website which is a very very different interface right and so there was just a lot of talk about interface conversion and you know delicious photography it's about having photography so high res on mobile that it keeps you engaged and draws you in mm -hmm. so that was that was at least the near term uh, near-term conclusion of these geniuses. Gotcha. Huh. Yeah. Um, guest experience. What are some of the things that you do um, in some of your hotels that keep those guests engaged and coming back? Um, what has surprised you um, from the research that you've done? And then how do your employees play a part of that experience? You know, I think it's very, very difficult to fake an experience and not get caught, right? So when you feign great service or uh, if you overly script something, I think it's pretty transparent today. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got very, very savvy customers, particularly when you're in urban markets. These are uh, generally very highly educated uh, professionals and uh, they know what they're doing and they've been to the rodeo before. And so it's really about being authentic, you know, and I hate to use the term because it's a bit hackneyed today, because even authentic as a term is becoming somewhat insincere. But it's really, you have to kind of go back to the culture. And I think what's difficult with non-portable assets that are flung across the country is how do you drive a singular culture at the property level that translates to that particular market or that sub-market and uh, you can, night after night, uh, make sure that your guests, because they're your guests, right? Like we've got a lot of cross-sell opportunities throughout our portfolio, that they're, that they're feeling like they are at a Hersha hotel, and that's a differentiated experience, and that drives their decision to stay. Uh, so I think it really matters. You have to have a great service culture to start with. And then, you know, the programming, and the thought and the design and uh, you know guest path uh, curation and all of that, that comes second. But I think it really starts with the service culture. Uh, I know you're gonna ask me, so how do you do that? <laughs> but if I told you, I would kill you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It'll just be too long a conversation. <laughs> um, uh, you stumped me. Already, you already answered one of my questions. Um, in terms of uh, engaging employees and retaining employees, but more specifically, corporate social responsibility, right, um, plays a part. Why is that important to you as an organization? 
and um, uh, yeah, let's go there. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, in our business, uh, it's all about the people, and so uh, we are very, very focused on how we recruit, how we select, and how we engage our teams. And uh, I talked about our core values. I think that's helpful to have an identity that goes beyond just profit motive. Uh, I think today people want to work for an organization that is not only greater than themselves, but something they can believe in, in addition to be able to uh, sustain a healthy and productive uh, personal and professional life. So, you know, how, you know, how do we do that? So, you know, it's about being really clear who we are uh, and our values. That's important. You know, Rabbi said earlier in his remarks, one person, when working with another, can lift the weight of three. And, uh, you know, my brother often refers to a quote that's attributed to Margaret Mead. It's unclear if she was the one who said it first, but a small group of people facing the same direction can change the world. And indeed, it's the only way to change the world. And so the way we think about it is keeping all of our folks facing the same direction. Uh, and beyond values, you know, we're very, very selective in who we bring on the team and, and the fit with the team and the culture and the mission. And then it's a matter of really, uh, I think, continuing to be a thoughtful company about the people. You know, it's, that needs to be something that is considered as heavily as the customer. Uh, as much as it is about, you know, as, as heavily as you consider your balance sheet and as heavily as you consider your returns, because it's all, they're all led to the same school, and I don't think the schools are sturdy without, without any one of them. Mm -hmm. What would you like everybody in the audience to know about Hersha that they might not know? You know, one of the things we didn't talk about, and it probably goes back, it's related to what we just talked about. One of our, one of our major initiatives is, uh, is a program called Earthview. And Earthview is our sustainability program. We, we employ a triple bottom line approach towards sustainability. And it's, you know, the triple bottom line is economic sustainability, uh, community sustainability, as well as environmental sustainability. And what I'll do is I'll, you know, uh, we'll send you a link to our Earthview annual report. We've had Earthview in place for about five years now. and. Uh, it encompasses our community giving and our community support programs. It encompasses our sustainability programs. Uh, and what we have found is that uh, beyond it being just something important for a corporate citizen to do, uh, it has created engagement with guests, with our partners in the industry, and with our associates. And I think it goes to uh, being beyond a corporate citizen to being a global citizen. Earth is something I'm very proud of. It was uh, fairly, fairly new in the hospitality sector. You'll see, you go to a lot of hotels and you'll see little cards like, you know, please reuse your towel to save the environment. Really what they're saying is please reuse your towel to save our laundry detergent. <laughs> <laughs> Transparent again. Like it's, uh, you know, so you know, you, I think I think Earthview though is something we do with a great deal of sincerity and, and I'll share the annual report. You guys might like to flip through it online. All right. All right, Jay. Great. Thank you very much.